song today is going to be number number two <coughs> sorry number two we're still we're a little bit hot on the can you turn the volume down this I think it's the volume a bit come yeah come up just a little bit now and we'll have it that's that's good can everybody hear me all right okay good Number two, we're going to sing the first, second, third, and fifth verses. First, second, third, and fifth. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of life, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne us and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Number 744, 744, God's family. We're going to sing the first and last verse. Seven forty four. We're part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. Now we're part of the family that's on its way home. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs, sometimes we dream together of how it will be. When we all get to heaven, God's family, and though some go before us, we'll all meet again, just inside the city, as we enter in. There'll be no more parting with Jesus. We'll be together forever, God's family. And 
And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs, sometimes we dream together of how it will be. Before uh, Mr. Jack Chambers, Brother Chambers leads us in our opening prayer, we're going to sing 797, 797. Sorry, we I hope we helped with the babies class today, and my VBS every VBS song I knew and mixed and matched the words, but I ne it was interesting. You never knew when they were going to the babies were going to be happy, and uh, sometimes they would start you know hitting things and screaming, and then you never knew. Tough crowd, but anyway, they had fun. I think. Seven ninety seven. We're going to sing uh, the first, second, and fourth verse, and then Jack will lead us in prayer. Lord, we come before Thee now, at Thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our Zeus disdain, shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain, shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain. Lord, on thee our souls depend, in compassion now descend. Fill our hearts with thy rich grace, tune our lips to sing thy praise, tune our lips to sing thy praise grant that all may seek and find the uh, god supremely kind heal the sick the captive free let us all rejoice in thee let us all rejoice in thee. Please bow. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here and worship you and learn more about you. Please be with our sick and our shut-ins and give them encouragement in their time of despair. And please, take, please help us take your words to heart as they're delivered to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, before the Lord's Supper, Brother Nathan Anderson is going to lead us in our thoughts before that, and we're going to sing number 286. We'll sing all three verses of 286, Wonderful Story of Love. Wonderful story of love, tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love, wake the immortal strain. Angels with rapture announce it. Shepherds with wonder receive it. Sinner, oh, won't you believe it? Wonderful story of love. Wonderful, 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 wonderful story of love. 
wonderful story of love. Though you are far away, wonderful story of love. Still he doth call today, calling from Calvary's mountain, down from the crystal bright fountain, in from the dawn of creation. Wonderful story of love, wonderful, 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 wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love, Jesus provides a rest, wonderful story of love. For all the pure and blessed, rest in those mountains above us, with those who've gone on before us, singing the rapturous chorus, wonderful story of love, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful story of love. In case anyone needs one, we have the communion cups, and if you raise your hand, someone will be more than happy to bring you one. Now, before we go to our Father in prayer for the remembrance of the gift that he gave and our sins that hung on the cross along with Christ. Let's think about how thankful we can be each and every day for that gift and the fact that God is so loving and graceful that he gave it with kindness and love. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we cannot thank you enough for the wondrous gift that you gave us. With all of the love and compassion that you show each and every day for each and every one of us, Please be patient, and please continue to forgive us whenever we fall short. Please forgive us of the sins that we have committed, and please continue to be with each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's pray for the cup and the covenant in which Christ's blood represents for each and every one of us. Dear Heavenly Father, once again we come before you requesting the forgiveness of our sins thanks to this new covenant, covenant that Christ gave on the cross that we all get to partake in through baptism and the fact that his blood is able to cover us in all of our sins before the judgment seat of you. Thank you once again for the many generous blessings that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we also want to think about the gifts that God has given us, and we would like to take this as an opportunity to pray over the collection that's out in the foyer and be thankful for everything that we have been given and be gracious in how we're able to give back to the, church, to the work that this church does. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you have blessed each and every one of us so generously, and we just pray that you are able to mold all of us and give us generous hearts so that we are able to give back to you and give back to others with our time, with our resources, and thank you for providing all of this to us in the first place. In Jesus' name, amen.
our invitation song today is going to be number 948, 948, I'm, I Am Resolved. But before our lesson today, we're going to sing 968, 968, they tell me of a home. And if you're able and you don't mind, please stand. We're going to sing uh, the first, second, and the last verse, first, second, fourth verse, 968. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a home where my friends have gone. Oh, they tell me of that land far away where the tree of life in eternal bloom shed its fragrance through the young clouded day oh the land of cloudless day oh the land of an unclouded sky oh they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise oh they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me that he smiles on his children there, and his smile drives their sorrows away. And they tell me that no tears ever come again in that lovely land of unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Please be seated. I think I turned this on. Yeah, it's on, right? Uh, good morning. It's great to see you all here today. Uh, what a wonderful day. What a wonderful thing to get to join together with other people and remind ourselves of what a wonderful creator we serve Amen. and what a wonderful future he has prepared for us. That land of cloudless day. I appreciate that song that Brother Brad led, and I appreciate your singing it. I appreciate being here with all of you. A lot of wonderful things going on here at Mountain Creek. We're in full swing of uh, VBS preparation mode. Uh, a lot of things going on, getting ready for that, but there are still uh, responsibilities that are open to people who have not yet uh, put themselves out there but would uh, like to get involved or would be able to get involved. It's one of the best things we do here, one of the, uh, one of the uh, best times of our year typically here at Mountain Creek, and we haven't been able to have a traditional VBS like we've always had for the last two years, uh, and so it's a really good thing um, that we're, we're getting back into the swing, but we need help. We need people. It's a, it's a great opportunity to work, but it's also an opportunity to have an impact on people's lives uh, and on the lives of children, and so we hope... Uh, that uh, people will take advantage of that uh, and where it's really made easy to serve God. What I want to do today is very similar to what we did last week. Um, as you know, several of us uh, about four weeks ago or five weeks ago, I, I don't even know how long ago it was now, um, took a trip over to Israel and uh, spent about three days in Greece at the end of the trip. And and I have been to Israel um, a couple of times before and have shared uh, quite a bit of photographs and lessons 
using those photographs from things we've learned there, but I'd never been to Athens or Corinth, and so uh, I was excited to be able to come back and to share with some of you uh, some of the things that we saw and some of the things that we learned, and the way those things can help us understand the Bible better and help us appreciate the lessons of Scripture a little bit better. Uh, and I was reminded uh, in trying to prepare these lessons like what I learned long ago, which is the first time I go to a place, I am a terrible photographer and uh, don't know what I should take pictures of and take way too many pictures of the wrong thing and no pictures of the right thing. Well, I did a little bit better this year at Athens and Corinth, but when I was trying to prepare these lessons, I was like, oh, I wish I had a better picture of this, or I wish I had taken a picture of that. But we'll do the, we'll do the best we can. Uh, we'll start out this morning in Acts chapter 18. Uh, last week, when we talked about Paul's visit and his sermon uh, on the Areopagus in Athens, we were in Acts chapter 17, uh, and we traced his journey where he came over from modern-day Turkey, which the, Ro the Romans called Asia, and he came over to Philippi as a result of the Macedonian vision. And I didn't really emphasize it last week like I intended to, but when he came over to Macedonia, in, to Philippi and Apollonia and Amphipolis and then Thessalonica and Berea, this is the gospel coming to Europe. And... Most of our ancestors, or at least most of us, have ancestors from Europe, and some also from, from Western Asia, and also Africa and places like that. But this is really the gospel coming toward the place where most of our ancestors probably lived. And that's what we're reading about here. And so he came down from Berea, he was... He was attacked and almost killed in Thessalonica. They came down to Berea and started to attack him there. So he, they put him on a boat and brought him all the way down to Athens. And then Acts chapter 18 verse 1 says, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And so that's what this picture shows. And that's Greece. Macedonia is a section of Greece at the top. Uh, and then over to the left, that's the Italy boot. And that big thing off the toe of the boot is, of course, Sicily. So we're right across the, uh, the Adriatic Sea uh, to, to Greece and Corinth. But you go closer in, and this is a close-up with Corinth right in the middle, and what you see there is you see a little strip of land between two big bodies of water. That little strip of land is called an isthmus. And that isthmus was a very important transportation route going back to 3, 4, 500 B.C. and coming forward all the way until the modern day. And all the way back as far as 30 or 40 B.C., the Romans wanted to build a canal through there so that they could conduct shipping through there, but they never could get the canal built. It was just too much work. But it finally did get built in the 1800s, 1800 years later, 1900 years later, it, it the same man who built the Panama Canal came and tried to build it and failed there too. And then the, the Greeks uh, finally got it done in the, in the late 1800s or early 1900s. And here is a picture of that canal as it looks today. Shipping is still going back and forth through there. But what you've got there is you've got a four-mile strip of land that separates two bodies of water. And so if we go back to that larger one, if you look down there to the south below that island where Corinth is, what you have down there is really treacherous water. And so the Greeks, I don't remember exactly what the phrase was, but the phrase was something like, if you go around the horn twice, it's like you're a really lucky man or something. The idea was, you take two trips, one of them you're going to die. It was just that treacherous to sail the fairly small ships that they typically sailed in that area down around the southern tip of mainland Greece. And so what they did was they came up this body of water and they transported it across this land. And so today there's a canal, but instead of building a canal, the Romans built a road. And they would take the ships, unload them, 
and pull them up onto this road on carts or on axles with wheels and they would roll the ships four miles across land to the other body of water. And so, why am I telling you all this? Not because I know you're geography students and just love world history. It's because this is what makes Corinth an important city. If you think about some of the cities that are really huge in shipping even today, then you will be imagining our experience with places that are somewhat similar to this. Places like San Francisco, California, or Los Angeles, California, the port of Los Angeles. I had to wait six months for my truck to get fixed several years ago because there was a dock worker strike at the port of Los Angeles and my part was out there in the port waiting to be unloaded. Six months I waited, driving a rental car because my truck wouldn't work without it because I had wrecked it. <laughs> Miami, Florida, huge shipping center. New Orleans, Louisiana also has major shipping coming down the Mississippi River. You think about those cities, New York City, New York Harbor. What do those cities have in common And most port cities? Shanghai, China. It's a collision of cultures, a collision of people, rapid transit combined with a lot of money. So you got a lot of people, a lot of travelers coming through all the time and a lot of money being made in that place. So you need a lot of people there. There's a lot of opportunity to make money and there's a lot of opportunity for people who are traveling, who are away from home, where nobody knows them, to engage in vice to engage in immoral behavior where they feel like they're unknown and nobody will know and they'll never get caught and it won't matter. And so the reputation of Corinth was very much like the reputation of Miami or San Francisco or New Orleans, a party town. That's what was happening and that's how Corinth was known. And it was huge and it was wealthy. Acts chapter 18, verse 12, records the experience that Paul had in Corinth. Paul is there. He starts teaching. He meets with some success, and God gives him a special message. God says to Paul, stay here at Corinth. I've got a lot of people here, and nobody's going to harm you. That's what Paul is told. And so Paul preaches and teaches, and he's telling, he is preaching the gospel, and he has a run-in with the Jews and he says, I'm finished with you. And he quits going to the synagogue and he starts going to the house of another man who was apparently beside the synagogue. The leader of the synagogue converts to Christianity. But then the Jews start to attack Paul and they take him. And they take him before the ruler of the province, the ruler of Achaia. That's Acts 18, chapter 12. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. So the Jews come before the Roman proconsul or the Roman governor and they say, This man is trying to bring in a new religion and new religion is illegal and you shouldn't stand for it, governor. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or of a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names in your own law, look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. Now notice there in, that, in verse 12, up there on the third line, they brought him before the judgment seat. Well, this passage goes on. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. And they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. 
Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Sincrea he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. Sincrea is right at the port on the Ionian Sea down to the south of Corinth, which we saw on that map a minute ago. So Paul is taken before the judgment seat. The judge says, I'm not paying any attention to this. Y'all get out of here. And he doesn't pay any, and they get so upset that they take the leader of the synagogue who has converted to Christianity, and they start to beat him right there in front of the governor, and the governor just ignores it, just won't even pay any attention. Well, in ancient Corinth, they have, actually in ancient Delphi, they have found an inscription that is one of the most important archaeological finds in dating the time of the Apostle Paul, and therefore in dating all of the dates of the New Testament. And this Delphi inscription refers to Gallio, the proconsul. The proconsul who is mentioned on the judgment seat there in Acts chapter 18. And they say this is apparently an inscription from Claudius Caesar, Caesar Claudius, and he says, we need people to repopulate Delphi. Delphi has lost population, and so we want to invite people to come in. And my friend and proconsul Gallio has confirmed these things. And it also gives the date as after the 26th acclamation of, of Claudius. And so looking at the Roman emperors, they know about when the 26th acclamation was, and so that puts this inscription at about A.D. 52. So that puts Gallio's proconsulship, which is two years long, about A.D. 50 to 52. And so Paul was in Corinth during that time. And so using that time, we can then date backward in Paul's life and forward in Paul's life and have a pretty good idea of exactly when the New Testament, especially the book of Acts and the epistles of Paul, occurred. And this is one of those details that Luke records. It seems like nothing. You read when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. But then you have this archaeological find and it proves exactly the truth. Now let me ask you something. A lot of people say the Bible was written hundreds of years after the fact. The Bible was written hundreds of years after these things supposedly occurred. Well, let's pretend that you're going to write something that you want people to believe is a real document that was written in the 1700s in the days of George Washington. And let's pretend you don't have an internet. Let's pretend you don't have Google. Can you name the governor of New York or Pennsylvania? Can you name the mayor of Philadelphia or Atlanta 200 years ago? No way. No way. And not get it right. Not get the timing right. That's how you uncover. That's how you unmask forgeries. They, they, you just can't get all of those little details right. The Bible gets everyone right. Because it was written, inspired by the Holy Spirit, during the lives of the people who lived it. And if it had been wrong the people alive then would have said, this is wrong. That's not true. They didn't because it was right, because it was true. This is the judgment seat at Corinth. Greek word in your New Testament is bima, and that's exactly what it's called there at Corinth today, the bima. And so what you have is you have a platform that's about six or seven feet tall, with, and it would have had a big, uh, a big marble thing built on the top of it with fancy chairs and columns and probably a roof over the area out in front of it where the people who come before the judgment seat would stand. And so Paul and the Jews would be down on the ground and Gallio would be up on the raised platform, the bema, the judgment seat, exactly as described in Acts chapter 18. And then later on, Paul uses this experience in Corinth in writing his 
letter to the Corinthians, which we call 2 Corinthians, one of his letters to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat, before the bema of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The Corinthians know what it is to be in an imperial city where there's a Roman governor with a judgment seat who sits in judgment over people with the power to condemn to death. Probably many of them had already been converted when Paul was dragged in front of that judgment seat. And he reminds them, we all have a date before a more important judgment seat, before a more important ruler, a king, and we will be judged. You too will be taken before Jesus Christ himself. You too will stand before your creator and the one who has offered to relieve you of your sins. And you will answer for how you lived and how you responded to the offer and to the teachings of Jesus. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But he's not going to ignore us. He's not going to say, that's none of my business. Get out of here. He's going to pass judgment. This is a picture of the marketplace. And right up behind this, you can see the remains of a temple, probably a temple to Apollo. But in the background, you can see a mountain, a really high, rocky outcropping, which is the way almost all Greek cities were built. They were built starting off on one of these really tall mountains that would create a fortress where you could flee if your city was attacked. And so everybody would take refuge there. But typically, they would really reserve it for like religious practices. Where we, last week, we talked about Athens and we talked about all these temples to Nike. I mean, to Athena. Athena, Nike, the Erechtheion, uh, the Parthenon, which is Virgin Nike. All these different things to Virgin Athena. All of these different temples to Athena. Well, in Corinth, it's not Athena, it's Aphrodite. And Aphrodite is the goddess of sex, sometimes called the goddess of love, but the goddess of erotic things and also fertility. The ancient Corinthians had a reputation for turning prostitute, prostitution into religion. And there's some debate among scholars and some people say the Athenians really blew it all out of proportion and, and said the Corinthians were way worse than they were. But one Athenian writer of the time said that there were a thousand temple prostitutes at the temple of Aphrodite in Corinth. There are actual historical records where people would bring female slaves and donate them to these temples to become temple prostitutes. And so you think about the reputation of places like San Francisco and Los Angeles and Miami and New Orleans and other transient cities. Even in our own day, there's almost always a huge component of sexual immorality. And the same was unquestionably true of Corinth. Corinth had a reputation among an immoral population, an immoral world of being especially immoral. And so you read the letters to the Corinthians and you see this reflected very, very clearly. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality. The word translated immorality in this passage is pornea. The root word for our word, pornography, pornographic, whatever else. But the King James translates it fornication. And fornication, general word for sexual immorality is exactly what it means. 
New American Standard says immorality, but the word has a specific sexual meaning, sexual immorality. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise up us up through His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. Nowhere else in the New Testament is prostitution discussed in this kind of detail. He goes on. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Flee fornication. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. The Corinthians were under a powerful temptation because sexual immorality was so ordinary, it was so common and easily available and not looked at as something socially unacceptable. Now it was unacceptable for women. We have a complete disparity between how men and women are treated on this issue in ancient Greece and in the first century world, especially in the Greek world. But for men... It was customary, commonplace. And the Bible doesn't care. The Bible doesn't apologize for how great the temptation is and how easy. It doesn't lower the standard for people living in a society where it's really, really common and really easily available. Same standard as it's always been. Purity. Holy living. Our own society tells everybody that there is no such thing as sexual purity. That sexual purity is a silly anachronism invented by religious people to control your life. So you should ignore it. You should throw it away. Sexual freedom, do anything that feels good, is how human beings can be the most happy. And nobody has ever found happiness that way. Not one person. Not one person has found lasting happiness through sexual immorality. But our children are being taught, and many apparently believe, that those rules, they're for an earlier time. Well, our society is bathed in sexual temptation and sexual immorality being promoted as normal. I have some I have some pages. You can join different groups on Facebook and so you can go there and so you can read about you, you know you can share with other people and read posts and see people answering questions about all kinds of things. I'm part of some preacher pages, some sermon pages, some farming pages how to raise crops, how to raise cattle, and stuff like that. And a few days ago, I start getting these advertisements on a farming page of barely dressed women. I mean, if something, if my son saw it, it would make me furious if a 13-year-old boy saw it. Because I know the effect it's likely to have on his head. But it's everywhere. Notice what the Holy Spirit says. Flee immorality. Corinthians, you're surrounded by it. Flee from it. Get away from it. I report those posts. I report it to Facebook. Inappropriate. Doesn't seem to do any good. But let me tell you, If you believe the lies that our society teaches, that it's okay, it doesn't hurt you, 
you will ruin or put in serious jeopardy one of the opportunities that God provides you for sustained happiness on this earth. And that is a normal, healthy relationship with a spouse of the opposite gender. If you pollute your spirit and sin against your body by ignoring God's instructions, you make it far more difficult for you to have a healthy relationship over a long period of time. Not only that, if you persist in that sin, you will condemn your soul to hell. And you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Another thing, another theme that we see emphasized over and over in the message to the Corinthians is unity, is togetherness. It starts out in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I've been informed by Chloe's, I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? You see, what they're doing is they're breaking up into separate groups. We talked about this a few months ago. But they're like, we're going to have our church over here, and we're going to have our church over here, and we're going to call ourselves different names. Now you think about a place where there's people from all different parts of the world coming for business and for other reasons, a place where people are moving in and moving out. There's this great disparity of background, of culture, and of wealth, people will naturally divide, naturally separate themselves, and gather to themselves people who are like they are. They want to be around people that they are like. The Bible says, don't do that. Don't do that. No divisions among you. Same mind, same judgment. He goes on in chapter 3. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. When you start naming yourself after men, you're turning your back on the one who actually called you. You should be called Christian. You should be called a follower of Jesus because he's the one who saved you. He's the one who called you. Apollos and Paul are just servants. You shouldn't be divided. You shouldn't be separating into separate groups. You shouldn't be called by different names. And so then you come to chapter 4, verse 6, and this is the verse that we repeated over and over for about six weeks. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that none one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. Paul sees division happening in Corinth, where they're separating, they're excluding people, they're calling themselves by different names. He says, don't do that. No divisions. How do you prevent divisions? How do you create religious unity? How do you keep different believers, different followers of Christ, being willing to operate together and to live together and to work together as one community, one group of people? You stay with what's written. It's the only way. The only way for everybody who claims to follow Christ to be same in one body without division, to be of the same mind and the same spirit, is to unite on the Word of God. To follow the Word of God, to prioritize the Word of God, and to deprioritize personal preference and taste. Because God comes first, God's most important, and God wants us to be one. And so we're going to stay with what He says, and we're going to suppress everything else. That was the message to this church 
that had so many different kinds of people. It's believed that Corinth probably had 150 to 200,000 citizens and 450 to 500,000 slaves, non-citizens. And so you think about the people who would have been a part of the congregation there and you would have had gigantic disparities of background, life circumstance, race, gender, wealth, childhood religion, all kinds of things. Paul says, stay united by staying with what's written. You even see these class divisions come into play in the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What, do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this, I will not praise you. You see, they're separating, they're dividing, and they're excluding. The rich are excluding the poor. The rich are treating the poor, maybe slaves, like second-class citizens. And politically... Legally, they were second-class citizens or down lower than second. Not in the church. Not in the church. In Christ, we are all equal. And you don't mistreat somebody because of how they look, or how they dress, or where they come from, or how much they have, or how they talk. Not the Lord's Supper is a uniting force. It is the time when we all come together and we share our commitment and our dependence on the body and blood of Jesus. And we realize that He gave this as a uniting act to unite us all together and to unite us with Him, not to separate. Also at Corinth, they found a temple to Asclepius. I should have put a picture in here from a pharmacy. I saw one on a card the other day where you see this like, um, this like shield and it's got two snakes wrapped around it. A lot of times you get a bag from your pharmacy, it'll have that shield on it. It's a medical symbol. That's an ancient Greek symbol to the god Asclepius. And in Corinth, they had a temple to Asclepius or an Asclepion. They also had one in Jerusalem, um, but we're talking about Corinth. But at this temple at Corinth, they have found all of these terracotta body parts where a person would have an injury to a leg or to a foot or to a hand. They even have one of a brain. And they would buy one of these molded body part shapes and they would bring it and they would offer it to Asclepius as a form of prayer for healing. It's really sad, but that's the best hope you have for improving your station in life. And you think about shipping, you think about moving heavy things, you think about wild cities and the danger that would lurk in those places. And you can imagine a lot of people would have severe injuries, crushed hands, broken knees, broken shoulders, head injuries, all kinds of things. And that's represented here. But Paul says something else to the Corinthians that also has to do with class divisions and divisions among the church that also sort of imports the vision that they might have had of people having all of these crafted body parts in their city. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 Verse 12, he says, Even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, Because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. 
And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it's not for this reason, any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the, one, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. He comes down to verse 25, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. It's very interesting that it's to the Corinthians, back up to chapter 5, and it's also mentioned in 2 Corinthians, where there is a man in the church who is engaging in sexual immorality. And Paul tells the church, put him out of the church. Exclude him from your worship. Exclude him from your fellowship. And then in 2 Corinthians, it indicates that he has repented and they should welcome him back. But here... He says, we're all one. You know, on this trip, we had about 19 people there. And we ate practically every meal together. We spent 8 to 12 hours a day together. And just in two weeks, you get really, really close. You develop really, really, really close relationships. And, and you develop new ways of communicating and inside jokes and your own language that you start to use very quickly. And my wife and I were talking about it. Imagine you were on, in a group like that where you're all dependent on each other and you're, you're going around together and then one of you does something that is just clearly wrong and the group says, you're not here anymore. You can't, be part, you can't come with us. You can't eat with us. It would be a huge loss. That's the real picture of the church. The real picture of the church is this connection. And if something bad happens to your foot, you whole, your whole body cares. And if something hap bad happens to a member of the church, the whole body should feel it. And when somebody is excluded or when somebody leaves, it should be like losing an appendage. That's how Paul talks about it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul also talks to these people who live in this very immoral city about redemption. And I'll end with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And now he describes their city. Neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. These big cosmopolitan shipping traveling cities have all of those things in great abundance. And so did Corinth. Notice what he says there. Such were some of you. Those people were converted. Those people who were fornicators and idolaters and adulterers and effeminate and homosexuals and thieves and swindlers, they responded to the gospel of Christ. Such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. We're not here to shame anybody. We're not here to call people names. We're not here to tell people that you're not worthy of being a part of this group. We're here to understand the Word of God and to declare the glory and the holiness and the majesty of God and to invite people into a relationship with God. And regardless of your past, regardless of your mistakes, regardless of your sins and your shortcomings, that can be only your past and not your present and not your future and the Corinthians show us that 
in a, an immoral place, a place of division and injustice and mistreatment. The gospel shone forth and thousands of people were saved by the blood of Christ. Are you saved by the blood of Christ? Have you had your sins washed? Have you had your soul sanctified, set apart for God? If you haven't, the offer still stands from Jesus to you. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, if you know what it means to become a Christian, if you're ready to begin walking by faith, if you're ready to confess that faith before people, if you're willing to repent, ready to repent, to stop living for yourself, start living for God, then you're ready to be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing. Our closing song will be number 138, the first verse, and then Jonathan Hicks is going to lead us in our closing prayer. 138, first verse only. I need the prayers of those who love me. I need the prayers of those who care. I need the help of every Christian to take God's message everywhere. He answers prayers for all the faithful. He holds the future in his hand. He'll guide us safely over Jordan. Our Heavenly Father understands. Bow with me in prayer, please. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of life, that we're still alive today, that every day we wake up and we're breathing air. It's another gift. It's a gift from you every day that we have to live. We ask you, Lord, to give us the wisdom to stay away from wicked lifestyles, immorality, and things that you would not want us to be doing on a daily basis. We ask you to give us the wisdom to make good decisions, to live lives that are pleasing in your sight, to be an example to others that aren't living the right lifestyle so that 
hopefully in time they can become Christians and be saved and live a life for you. And we need to be an example to this world. There's so many lost souls that could be saved and could have a home with you in heaven. And we could be the tool and the vessel that you use to accomplish that. And we know, Lord, that your gospel, that you want it to spread throughout this world. And you can use all of us to do that. And we ask you to help us, to give us the strength and wisdom and uh, the courage to stand up for your truth and for Christianity and for Jesus and what he has done for all of mankind. And we ask you, Lord, to, th to help us every day. We lift up everything that we're dealing with in our personal lives, things we're struggling with, prayers that have been unanswered so far. We know in your good time you will answer all of our prayers, that you will always have our back, and you're always going to have our back because you're our best friend. And we thank you, Lord, for all of that. In your name we pray. Amen.